13 years ago, a judgment was delivered, which till now is explained as very strange circumstances that surrounded that particular day. A day that was not set for judgment to be pronounced, he experienced judgment day on that day. That day has offered him moments of reflection that he offers lessons out of and also issues that bothers on the development of this country. Today, we're sitting with him to reflect 13 years ago the incident that happened on June 18, 2008. Lawyer Chachu Chikata is a private legal practitioner. He lived through it and he tells the story in different ways over the last 13 years. Lawyer Chachu Chikata, thank you so much for making the time to sit with us again. Thank you for having me on the program. Um, June 18th is indeed for me an unforgettable day, as you can imagine, uh, because it was not an expected occurrence mm -hmm. at all in my life. You know, I had, I had left home after having had a nice, Bible reading, sitting with my wife, you know, and I remember the passage very well. Genesis chapter 2, a beautiful description of God creating the garden, and then also the waters, exactly. the rivers with gold and so on. And, and, and you know, the, the scenery of exactly. this garden, which we are sitting in right now, yes. gives us a clear reflection of what you're talking about. Absolutely. <laughs> so... <laughs> That's what we read, that, that's what we read. And then I go to court knowing that the judge has been postponing the case for the last year and a half. You know, the case was just adjourned. In fact, many of the occasions she would not even sit. The court clerk would just come and announce that, you know, a new date had been fixed. So that happened for about one and a half years. So I'm going to court, I just say to my wife, I'm going to take a date, so I'll be back very soon. And then I drive myself, and I go and pick up my good friend, Martin Newman, and we go to court, expecting to take a date. And then it turns into not something Not actually else. a judgment on that day. It was not a judgment day. Nothing like that had been indicated. In fact, what was scheduled for that day was the application that we had made, my lawyer had made an application that the Attorney General in the Supreme Court had made certain admissions about the case. You see, he had admitted that the project in which the whole Valley Farms investment had That's been right. made was a viable project. He admitted that in the Supreme Court, even though it was a different story in the High Court. So we were saying, we were applying mm -hmm. to the court that what he had admitted in the Supreme Court should be brought into evidence in the High, high court, court so that, you know, the High Court would have a clear record of what they were saying in the Supreme Court because we were in the Supreme Court on the issue of whether the IFC is a compellable witness or not. So, you know, you know that was the application that was before the court. And there's something I want us to do for, for our viewers' sake. I think we haven't sometimes taken time to talk about the case itself. What, what did GMPC have to do with Valley Farms exactly? Good question. Very simple. You know, GNPC was responsible for imports of crude oil and petroleum products. That was our responsibility. And we were supposed to do it on a commercial basis, in addition to our responsibilities in connection with exploration and so on. But for the import of oil, which was what used up a lot of Ghana's foreign exchange, we had to collaborate with Cocoa Board, because Cocoa Board was responsible for our exports of cocoa from which Ghana earned the foreign exchange for largely importing crude oil. So as a result of that collaboration in that period, we actually raised 
syndicated bank financing from the capital markets in London against the cocoa contracts that you know were available from cocoa, cocoa board. board. In a similar way, what Valley Farms was offering, because this was a company that was now going to be producing uh, cocoa at a certain rate. You know, they've done all the feasibility studies according to our advisors, mm -hmm. Merchant Bank. I see. And so what Merchant Bank came to us with was an opportunity to associate with this new cocoa production entity because they too would have future contracts to sell cocoa which could back GMPC's financing and, and Merchant Bank have done its feasibility studies. Merchant Bank and one of the IFC subsidiaries, they were our advisors. And they actually brought the project, Merchant Bank brought the project to us. The reason why we were asking for IFC to be made a witness mm -hmm. was because one of their subsidiaries had also been involved in the feasibility studies. And you know, the Agence Francaise de Development, the yeah. French Development Agency, actually had a witness come to testify, and they also testified about the feasibility of, of the project. Of the project. Why know. did the court decline to have an IFC? The person? court said that the IFC is immune from the jurisdiction of the Ghanaian courts. Now, there is no basis for that legally, so we took that matter to the Court of Appeal. And in the Court of Appeal, what happened was that the immunity of the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, which does not have commercial dealings with, with entities, that immunity which is provided in a statutory, a, a, a piece of subsidiary legislation, that was read into the IFC's uh, um, authorization. And These are the two, two are different Totally different. So when we took the matter up to the Supreme Court, eventually the Supreme Court acknowledged that we were right. But you see, on June 18th, the Supreme Court had not yet decided on that matter. The Supreme Court had set the 25th of June for their decision. So again, we thought, based on what the judge herself had said for the last one and a half years, that she was waiting for the Supreme Court to give their decision the, very, the following week. And so June 18th, I mean, I, I go to court, basically, I mean, I'm laughing at it, but it's not a laughing matter. I go to court not imagining that any sort of judgment was going to be delivered. But the judge had asked us to come early that day. So we went at 8 o'clock, you know, earlier than usual. And one of the first odd things that I noticed was that the Attorney General, Joe Gatti at that time, had come with his full team. And he had not been in court for the last one and a half years. In fact, when the trial started. The last that one day, and a half years, when the, when the adjournments were being done on. By, the, by the judge, right. he, had, he had not been to court. So, but suddenly that day, he's there with a full team, uh, five people. And I sort of wondered a bit, but I thought no more of it. Mm. I, I thought it was perhaps because um, we had been applying that what he said in the Supreme Court should be brought. So maybe he was coming to explain something about that. So, to cut a long story short, things turned in a different direction when the judge actually sat. Uh, my lawyer had notified the court that um, he was traveling, and in fact, July had been set as the date for the application that we were making. But suddenly, we were called by the registrar of the court and told that the judge had asked for it to be brought forward to June 18th. Mm -hmm. So June 18th, as it turned out, was a day on which a lot of things had been prepared. And um, what had been prepared was essentially for a judgment, judgment to be given and for me to go to jail. But let me find out this. What's this? 
trial at any point about the viability of the project in itself? Well, you, know? you see, originally the prosecution said they had issues with the viability of the project. Mm -hmm. But then when we went to the Supreme Court, the Attorney General was now saying they had no problem with the viability right. of the project. That's what the Attorney General stated yes. at the Supreme Court. Exactly. And that is why we were insisting that the record of what the Attorney General had said in the Supreme Court should be now part of the record of the High Court proceedings, mm. together with whatever testimony the IFC was going to be giving. That, that was where we were at. So we were not at a stage where judgment really should be expected, because we still had the IFC uh, evidence to be taken, and we also had the application that we were making that what the Attorney General had admitted in the Supreme Court should be on the record of the High Court. And, and, and I'm trying to understand this because, I mean, to, to be charged with causing financial loss to the state, the viability of the project should obviously form the basis Absolutely. for Absolutely. such a conclusion to be made. No question. You're, you're right. I mean, so logically, it should. The, 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 logically and, and, and that legal, was never determined. And legally, it should. It was not. And you see, I think it's very really important to highlight the fact that, you know, I did not just act on my own as an individual, or GMPC did not just act even on its own as a corporate body. We had Merchant Bank, not only as a financial advisor, at that time Jude Arthur, I think, was the managing director of Merchant Bank. They were not only our financial advisors, they were trustees of GNPC in respect of that project. So Merchant Bank, and specifically Jude Arthur, was actually representing GNPC's interests on the board of Valley Farms. The board of Valley on Farms. the board of Valley Farms. And in fact, they introduced the project to us. So in terms of viability, we were insistent that the records of the IFC, together with what the Attorney General had admitted in the Supreme Court, would set to rest the matter of viability. And that was never allowed. I mean, you mentioned Judatha, and, and, and it's those who are very familiar with the proceedings and his disposition and testimony in court, it, it's at variance with what you're saying right now, because if he was a, a member of the board of trustees, then certainly he should be privy to certain detail, for instance, about the viability of the project and some of the other things which could actually then bring in the question no, you're, about... You're absolutely right. Junatha was indeed the key prosecution witness against me. And what was interesting was that his testimony was, in many respects, shown up as false. And you presented this in court? Yes, because we managed to get, under subpoena, we managed to get records from Merchant Bank regarding how the Valley Farms project became part of you know, their work in, in the first place. Because you'd rather try to give the impression that I was the one who introduced Valley Farms yeah. to Merchant Bank. It was completely the opposite and brought out all those matters. So in, in fact, in the long run, um, we constructed what we called a table of the lies that were told. And you, you know, presented this in and court. And presented this in court as part of our submissions to court. Because really, it was so clear from not only the uh, records of Merchant Bank, but from the evidence of other witnesses, including the then managing director of Valley Farms, Mr. Jim Wilson. I mean, he made it clear. He did not, you know, I mean, he, he did not try to tell the story that was told uh, by, by Mr. Jude Arthur. Uh, he made it quite clear that he went to Merchant Bank, um, you know, to raise financing for him. And Merchant Bank mentioned GMPC as one of the people that they could bring in to play a role initially by way of a guarantee. And, and as I said, you know, GMPC's interest in cocoa did not start with Valley Farms. We started working with Cocoa Board 
and we raise money for imports of crude oil and petroleum products on this country, for this country on the back of those you know, arrangements with Cocoa Board, their, their forward um, sales mm. and the contracts and so on were the basis on which we were able to raise financing to keep oil flowing, you know, for, right. for Ghana's requirements. And, and so that was, that was really the, the basis of this relationship also. So there was some precedence. Fund. There was precedent that kind of transaction. Absolutely. In fact, work, work. to this day, as you know, Cocoa Board finances the purchase of its uh, of the cocoa crop from raising money outside, syndicated financing, and then uh, you know paying cocoa farmers uh, for the crop. And, and that was something that we kind of uh, initiated with Cocoa Board in about 92 thereabouts yeah. and 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 that has continued to this day you know i think for cocoa board at that time in terms of the relationship with gmpc the clear benefit to them was that gmpc was getting cds from our sales of products yeah. to the marketers so we could also provide cds to cocoa board at a much lower cost than what they would get from going to banks. Right. In return, we used the sales that they had made forward of cocoa as collateral to back our financing to import crude oil. It's a very simple structured I mean, finance yeah. transaction. And that led us to more interest, you know, because in those days, again, cocoa had been in decline and it was now picking up again. So we were interested in ways in which you know, uh, uh, the, the, the decline was being reversed, such as the Valley Farms project. The Valley Farms project was in fact built around previously abandoned cocoa farms, which were now being rehabilitated in order to uh, be, be, be used to export more cocoa for the country. So I think people make a whole lot of mystery around, you know, why should GMPC be involved in Valley so, Farms? And I think and so that on. that's the explanation but, that is good for our, our viewers well, as well. Well, it's, it's a very simple reality uh, that we had to deal with. We had to deal with innovative ways of raising finance. And the relationship with Cocoa Board was one of the things that we did. I remember um, uh, the, the, the banks in, in, in London, like Bankers Trust and so on, who got involved with us. You know, they were very excited by the innovative approach that we brought in, in terms of our relationship with Cocoa Board, providing them lower cost of funds locally, and we also then having the benefit of their contracts to raise a foreign exchange that GMPC needed for importing crude oil for the country's benefit. The crude oil was not imported for my personal benefit. Help the viewers actually understand why the Court of Appeal judge described the ruling as a miscarriage of justice. And that's why I wanted us to get into the detail of the case. Well, because people see, read yes. that judgment and don't understand, then why did you have to go through all of that? Well, you see, the Court of Appeal was quite clear that there was a miscarriage of justice on the basis that that June 18th was never a day set aside for judgment. The Court of Appeal was quite clear also that there was an outstanding issue of the IFC testifying. That's right. And that outstanding issue had not been resolved. The Court of Appeal could have said, well, it's a mistrial, you know, the trial should start again. But when a Court of Appeal is faced with such a situation, the Court looks at the record, the record of what you know, evidence has been given and so on. And the court can decide that, look, based on this, we are acquitting and discharging rather than having the thing go back for a new trial. Right. And in this case, the court acquitted and discharged me. Um, they acquitted me on all counts because really there could be no basis for a judgment that something that the attorney general had decided was a viable project and something that we had shown. And this is the Attorney General. The, the Attorney General had decided. Jogate. He, he said it in, in, in Jogate. He said it in the Supreme Court. That it's 
The viability Bible, is unquestionable. Yes, they are not contesting that viability. So, I mean, it's very difficult to understand how, with that, any judge could say, I've caused financial loss. Indeed, even the value of the land which Valley Farms, you know, had in relation to that, nobody was interested in determining whether the value of that land would not be sufficient, you know, to cover the guarantee. But that was what Merchant Bank was supposed to do on behalf of GMPC. They were supposed to be our trustees enforcing whatever rights we would have uh, to, you know, the property of Valley Farms if they were not able to deliver on their obligations. But unfortunately, uh, Merchant Bank didn't do that. Uh, I was rather faced with a situation where the managing director of Merchant Bank was claiming that I had rather brought uh, What was running Valley through your Farms. mind all those times? I mean, right. having seen this person who was supposed to actually be on the board of trustees now. Well, it was on the board of Valley Farms. Valley Farms. Because the Merchant Bank was a trustee of GMPC as far as that investment was concerned. That was the relation. And again, fortunately, the records that we managed to get out of Merchant Bank established that trusteeship relationship very clearly. And other witnesses testified confirming that trustee relationship. There were other, I think there were two other people from the legal department of Merchant Bank who also came as prosecution witnesses. And in cross-examination, they had to admit this trustee relationship. So, I mean, look, I, I, as I keep saying, that day was not even a day when judgment was supposed to be given because the case wasn't yet over. Mm. But somehow, that day was meant in some people's minds to be the day when I was going to go to jail. And I, I did end up in jail. You, you described those events as very strange happenings at the time. In fact, this is a case study for a lot of law students <laughs> in this country um, who, who are told something contrary to everything that you've said right now. Well, you, I think the record of proceedings is available for anybody who cares to look at them. And I think the record is what was before the Court of Appeal, yeah. which led the Court of Appeal to give a decision reversing that decision on the 18th and uh, acquitting and discharging me on all counts. And I can only thank God that that happened. It's true, it took a while to happen. Um, it on was all November. Four counts. November 16th, November 30th, I'm sorry, 2016, uh, was when that, you know, uh, acquittal uh, happened. Mm -hmm. Um, and I spent the period from 2001 to 2016 basically trying to, um, you know, defend myself. And, and I'm glad, I thank God, that eventually that actually happened. But going back to June 18th mm -hmm. itself, you know, what for me is um, an important lesson that I personally... Uh, took away from that experience was I was in court that day in the end having to represent myself and I was you know reminding the judge of decisions that she herself had made she herself had said she was awaiting the decision of the Court of Appeal and the decision of the Supreme Court ultimately um, you know she herself had been adjourning because she had specifically said that if she didn't do that, there would be a mistrial, okay? She had said all those things. I see. Now, and Justice so... Justice Harry Taban itself had said yes, that? Yes, on previous sittings. That if the, the, the Court if of... If she did not wait for, for the, the decisions Court, of the Court of Appeal first and the, and the Supreme, Supreme Court, Court, she would be... Uh, I mean, there would be a mistrial. mistrial. Exactly. She had used those words. Now, in spite of all that, she still went ahead to pronounce a judgment on that day. Now, I mean, you Is can't... Is there any way in law that that's permitted? You can't really make head or tail of that 
in legal, purely legal terms. But the, the lesson that I'm trying to draw is this. We all want to have confidence in the judicial system. We yeah. want to have confidence that when we go to court, the decisions will be based on the law and the facts and so on and so forth. But we also have to recognize that, unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. There are other factors that influence the cause of justice, sadly, including the factors of political pressure being brought to bear on judges to come to a certain decision, you know, at all costs. And in my case, there was no question about the fact that, I mean, the political pressure from right up to the president's level, the attorney general at that time, now the president, Nana Kufuado, President Kufo, I mean, they were determined that I would have to go to jail. And that determination seemed to be based on the wish to demonstrate that certain things had not been done right under President Rawlings in the past. You know, 2001... We see this happening, that... If, if, if the previous administration always, when there's a government or a party in opposition, they promise that when they come into power, exactly. they are going to prosecute people in the exactly. previous administration exactly. for one wrong or the other. So it becomes a political promise to prosecute. So they necessarily have to find, and it's actually sometimes just ongoing, be on, on both sides on both of the You're absolutely right, unfortunately. But let me tell you something. You're right to say that it's happened on both sides, but I can tell you from my experience of President Mills. He was a president who refused to be drawn into that kind of tit-for-tat arrangement. And he was never going to allow, and I, 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 I heard this commitment directly from him. And I knew how concerned he was, you know, that There's the no rule of law vendetta. should be, yes, political vendetta should stop. Now, I can't say that for others, but what happened in relation to me had all the imprints of that kind of political vendetta. And by God's grace, I was, you know, vindicated in the long run. But it certainly is not a good experience that we need to keep repeating in our country. I, I, I think there's got to be a way in which you know people try to address issues with a certain objectivity. That's not easy either, you know, because when people come to power, they want to show that uh, uh, they are doing the right thing, whereas other people didn't do the right thing, and so on and so forth. But I, I look forward to the day in this country where we can actually have leaders like President Mills not preoccupied with trying to prosecute and you know jail people from the other side but people who say look we're all in this country together let us see how to enhance what has gone on before let us see how what happened under president Rawlings should be continued what happened under president Kufo should be continued what happened under president Mahama you know and so on but that is not really what our record shows we have been doing, except for that example that I gave of That's President right. Mills. But you know, if, if, if politics can actually have a direct bearing and, and extensive influence on the judiciary, and that, that's dangerous. That's, that's, it, is, uh, it, it is dangerous, unfortunately. It's dangerous because what it means is that people begin to lose confidence in the judiciary. People begin to lose confidence in the outcomes of judicial process because they begin to feel that we are going to court trying to state our case and trying to get justice to be administered, but we might end up, in fact, just having a certain political power position imposed on us. And that's a very dangerous situation uh, to have as a country because 
It, it means that all the time there will be people very aggrieved because they think that if they are going to take a matter to court, they may not get a just. They are not going to get a just decision. That's a very dangerous situation to be in, and I hope and pray that we can, you know, rise above that kind of situation. But um, unfortunately, some of the omens do not look so great. Do you, do, do you question the independence of the judiciary now? Is it well, I think the the evidence is there that there has been interference politically with judicial decision making. And as I say, in my case, yeah. um, it was very clear. And also one, one important thing about June 18th that I forgot to mention, you know, that day, as I realized later, prison officers were already on standby around the courts to take me already. to They were already you know, so on standby. There was a full arrangement in place. There was a full arrangement in place. The police had come there in full force. Again, I didn't notice it when I went so early, but that day the police were already, you know, uh, prepared. Mm. Because when the news began to come out that, you know, this is what was going on in the court, a crowd started gathering. And the police were already prepared there. You know, as I said, the Attorney General was there with his full, full team and so on. So, I mean, there was clearly uh, uh, a premeditated you know, plan that was just put in place on that day uh, using, 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 using the judge. So I don't think that, I mean, from such examples, anybody can doubt the, the level of political interference. And, and let's face it, let's face it. Mm -hmm. We, 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 we have to deal with the human reality that judges are appointed by presidents. See, and that's, I was coming to the point that will the judiciary ever be independent, especially because of the appointment of the chief justice by the president? It's not only the chief justice, frankly. I mean, judges get appointed. Of course, they go through a process and so on. Uh, from the judicial, uh, you know, council, uh, nominations are made and, and all that. But they are put forward by the president to, to parliament. The chief justice is appointed uh, by the president. And again, that's not unique to Ghana, you know, that happens around the world. But you see, there are many appointments that are made by the president under the constitution. And again, that's as it should be because the president is the leader of the country is... Uh, there are some who think that there are too many of them. Yes, but, but I'm saying that it is for the president to show that he's not appointing the judges because they are his party favorites or because he wants them to do his bidding. It is for, for any president to show that the independence of the judiciary really means something and, and therefore not to interfere as President Kufour clearly did in my case. It, it, it is always for the president to rise above that. And as you've seen in other places, you know, when uh, President Trump thought that the Supreme Absolutely. Court would come to his rescue and somehow pronounce uh, certain things in his favor, you know, during the election uh, situation in, in the U.S., he didn't, he didn't get his way because the judges were trying to go by the law and trying to show themselves independent of any president. So I think we, we need to get to that place where, one, the leader himself is not expecting people to do his bidding, but two, the judges themselves, out of a respect for their own role, and, and the importance of that role within the constitutional system, the importance of the independence that they are supposed to have, where they themselves have a commitment to ensuring that what they do is guided by legal principles, legal authority, and 
you know, they show fidelity to the law and to justice. Mm. That's what their oath of office enjoins. Fidelity to, to the law. And, 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 and you, like the father, you put it in both ways. So it goes both ways. The appointer must have some principles guiding the whole process. And the appointee, who is in this case the chief justice and the judges, must also exhibit some principles in the discharge of their duties. But, but uh, let's localize this. I mean, let, and you talk about we facing the realities of, of what we are confronted with as a people. Would you recommend that that process of appointment changes because of the politics of patronage that we have in this country? Or we should impress on you know, the appointer and the appointee to actually go by, for instance, what you are suggesting, in order to deal with the perception of the lack of independence of the judiciary? You know, I don't have any other approach necessarily to recommend as far as appointments to such high offices are concerned. But I think that what I said regarding the sense of responsibility that judges themselves should have, they are professionals. They are people who are supposed to be appointed because of their high integrity. They are people who swear an oath you know, to administer the law you know, in accordance with uh, the right legal principles and with justice. So I think that that's where a lot of the burden lies. But we as citizens also have a certain responsibility because, you know, when people complain, as we've seen in recent years, people complain about corrupt judges. Yes. You know, you had Anas investigations and so on. But it's individuals whose cases were before the judges who sought to influence the judges. Just as I'm saying, you can have a president seeking to influence uh, a judge. You have individuals in the cause of their case seeking to influence the judge. Now, that means that there is responsibility on us as people. And that responsibility is not only when we have a case before the court, but in a sense, it is just as citizens who are wanting to make sure that all their institutions work properly. So for instance, I think that, you know, the Bar Association has often been very, you know, prominent in advocating certain important legal positions that should be respected by people in government yeah. and so on. I think the Bar Association has an important responsibility to ensure that the administration of justice is conducted with a total respect for the independence of the judiciary. So when you have a situation where, as in my case, sadly, I, I, I have to give uh, examples from my case Absolutely. because I know directly some of the things that happen. Where you have a situation where the president of the Bar Association gives an interview after he, he and his executive have come to visit me in the prison and they, you know, he gives an interview in which he recounts some of the things that I had talked about and, and makes the point that if that is indeed the case, then there is cause for concern. He does that, this was Neil Samuels, yeah. and a lot of pressure is put on him and he ends up being removed as president of the Bar Association because there are other political forces that do not want any contestation about what has been done to me. And they don't even want the facts to become better known. So when a president of the Bar Association comes out publicly and speaks about things that are part of the record, they, are, they can't be really disputed and the Court of Appeal in the end acknowledge that, he gets removed by the Bar Association. So that tells you that 
the responsibilities are not only of the judges themselves. Because if, if at that time the Bar Association president's position had been taken up, you know, the rest of the, uh, uh, the council of, of the Bar, the, the other leaders That's saying, right. look, this is a matter that we want to go into uh, carefully and make sure that the independence of, of uh, the judiciary is respected. I think that it would have, it, at least it would have made the president, you know, sit up somewhat, you know, not in my case, he'd already done the worst, mm -hmm. but it would prevent him maybe next time from adopting the same approach. And, and it would make future presidents aware that if you, if you take these positions, which are then implemented by judges on your behalf, some people, like the Bar Association, would rise up against it. Other civil society organizations, you know, should also take an interest right. such that, you see, justice, as the Constitution says, is administered in the name of the people. Justice is administered in the name of the people. The judiciary does not just claim its authority from their individual, you know, sort of selves or from the fact that the, the, the president has appointed justice is administered in the name of the people. So the people have every right and every responsibility to raise concerns when that justice is not really being administered properly. And that is why when there are exposures like the ANAS exposures and so on, it becomes a matter of great public interest and public interest not only in Ghana because we are trying to attract, let's say, investors That's right. on the basis that the rule of law is implemented in Ghana. So if an investor begins to realize that these courts are acting really at the behest of the executive. They are not really acting on principle. As you said earlier, that is dangerous for, for the country in so many ways. Dangerous because then those investors will have no confidence in the system and therefore they will not be willing to invest. I mean, we saw some of this <coughs> when in GNPC we were trying to promote the petroleum potential of Ghana to investors outside. We had to let them appreciate that our court system, our judicial mechanisms work independently and satisfactorily to deal with disputes in a manner that is just, such that they will feel comfortable about bringing in their investment. So these are really serious and fundamental issues that, that can affect a lot of things uh, for our country. And, and, and that's why I'm saying that, you know, the lesson from my experience that I keep drawing out, that it is not good for that kind of political interference to, to take place, not only because, you know, Chachu Chikasa wants to be a free person and there's been a free Chachu campaign or whatever, but also because the signals that are sent out about the lack of independence of the judiciary have extensive ramifications which do not benefit the country. I was amazed and I'm still amazed at the extent to which people outside were following the cause of my trial. People in the oil industry were following and, and really paying attention and and recognizing that things were just being done by way of a political, I was really amazed because in the end, if you like, that is what protected me, you know, afterwards. You know, if, if, if people in the industry had felt that here was this financially irresponsible uh, chief executive and he's been jailed, uh, good riddance to him and so on, I would not subsequently have been able to look anybody in the eye in the industry. But mercifully, people out there knew what was going on. And subsequently, I was completely embraced 
you know, by people in the industry who actually felt sorry for what I'd had to go through and who maintained their confidence in dealing with me to enable me to do my own private, uh, you know, business in the industry to this day. So, I, you know, I, 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 I can't thank God enough for his mercies. And you, you, you call this uh, when you were marking uh, the decade of 10 years on overflow of praise. That's, of praise. You that's talk about what it. my overflow of praise is about. That's exactly it. Because, I, you know, in all that I went through, um, I, I've come out feeling that there is nothing that summarizes what I went through more than just giving praise to God. In, in fact, the song that always used to ring in my, in my mind and in my heart during those five months in prison was a song of Danny Nette. Danny Nette composed a song, I will worship you, I will lift up your name forever. You are Lord. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. And you know, I, I didn't realize that it was Danny Nettie's composition when we used to sing it in church. And um, I went to prison and this was a song that kept ringing in my, in my, in my ears and in, in, in my heart, in my mind. And then sometime after I came out, I was talking with one of our, our, young, our young friends. In fact, it was in Houston in the U.S. when my wife and I were visiting. And I was talking about how this song had really ministered to me. And he said, oh, that's Danny Nette's song. So I said, oh, who's Danny Nette? And then eventually we got to meet Danny Nette. He sang, um, he came and sang at an event that marked, uh, I think my 60th birthday, 10, 10 years or so ago. And sadly, he's no, he's no more with us. But it was, it was, it was a song that really summarize for me that whole time i will worship you i will lift you high above the earth you are yes, god yes you are, you are. you know june 18 2008 is a moment of praise for him as a matter of fact um even though it was a day of strange happenings <laughs> um, as he's been talking about legal luminary private legal practitioner lawyer Chachuchikata, talking about 13 years on that experience that has indeed dotted our, our legal space in this country, raising lots of questions, eventually uh, being described as a miscarriage of justice by the Court of Appeal um, of, of, after that five month period in prison. Now, because you talk about miscarriage of, the miscarriage of justice, during your time in prison, you interacted with a lot of people in there. And one of the things that we've gotten to know, at least for media people, is people who are in jail unjustifiably. Did you encounter those people? Sadly, and, uh, too many, too many, too many, too many of those people, including people who were on remand, sometimes for as long as 12 years. In other words, their case had not even been adjudicated, but it kept being adjourned and for adjourned. 12 years. And some for as many as 12 years on remand. In some cases, the excuses were that the policeman who was handling the case has been transferred somewhere and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this became quite That's a right. big issue. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, you know, the Chief Justice at that time uh, tried to address that by um, having the courts even sit in prison and so on. I'm not yes. too sure that that was actually a right solution because constitutionally courts must sit in public, you know. That's right. Uh, so, you know, I'm not too sure about the courts sitting in, in a prison setting. But the, the point is that there were just too many of these cases where people, you know, were in prison, they would be taken to court, the prosecutors are not ready to continue with their case. And unfortunately, it's still happening. Yes, absolutely. And you see, the, these, these are the things that I'm saying cannot be left just, so to speak, to the judges who are handling particular cases. All of us must have a concern about it because what that means, for instance, is that our prisons are full of people who really shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. You know, um, they, they are there because their case has not even been adjudicated. I mean, there's supposed to be a presumption of innocence. But in reality, in their case, 
it's a presumption of guilt because they are actually experiencing imprisonment, you know, even before the case has been adjudicated. So, so I think we, we, need to, we need to be concerned about that. We need to be concerned about the fact that the space that is occupied by those people in the prison is part of the pressure that it puts on the public purse. I mean, you hear about the minimal amounts that are being used yes, in to fact, feed. They are, they are fed one city 80 pesos a day, 60 pesos for breakfast, 60 pesos for lunch, 60 pesos for supper. I mean, how is that going to feed an adult human being in Ghana today? I mean, it, it's, it's unthinkable, you know, and I think it should, you know, in, in, in my experience, um, I kind of took it as a learning uh, thing. So from that, I became a little more sensitive, perhaps. But I'm hoping that it, it doesn't take us all having to go through the experience in order to be sensitive yeah. to it, you see. Because really, the, these are things about which our leaders should feel, you know, a real sense of urgency. Mm. Uh, to, to, to address. You, you think know? that the state hasn't shown that sense of agency to address well, the... Well, when you look at the conditions that still persist yes. in the prison, I mean, there's still overcrowding. And of course, last year, with all the COVID-19 situation, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't know how they coped, but... Well, recently we've had some church, uh, church building a, an ultramodding prison, <laughs> uh, something that you say the state should be doing, but the state... It's, it's certainly, I mean, you, it's certainly um, you know, nice that a church feels called upon as part of their Christian responsibility uh, to, you know, build an ultra-modern prison. But what I'm insisting is that that should itself be a signal of the need for urgency by the state. Right. Because we say that we should separate church and state. That's right. The state has certain responsibilities. The church has certain responsibilities. Prison, administration of justice, you know, taking care of crime. These are things that the state is primarily responsible for. So for me, that signal from the church should only heighten the sense of urgency that the leaders of the state have in relation to issues around the prisons. Not only how much is used to feed prisoners, but just the health conditions of prisoners. You know, on the 10th anniversary of um, uh, when, when I came, I, I mean, of June 18th, the 10th anniversary of June 18th, actually, it was around June 20th, um, uh, 2018. A pastor who I think I mentioned in a previous interview had been very, very uh, um, impactful in a message he delivered on my Sunday, uh, on my first Sunday in prison. He arranged with some other colleagues and some other doctors to do a medical outreach at Insaum Prison. Because again, the health conditions of prisoners are a source, I mean, you know, of, of concern. You know, there's a part of the story that many people don't know. The role that your wife played while you, you were in prison, those five months. Now, tell us about it. Well, I think, you know, my, my wife just was amazing. Um, and, and again, I, I, thank, I, I can't thank God enough um, for her and, and, and from the moment that, you know, whilst the judge was delivering her judgment, my wife got a call from my sister who had also got to hear that the judge was going on even though nobody expected it. So that's how come she came to uh, the court immediately. And one of the things she said, um, you know, that day, I think when, when some media people tried to interview her, I think summarized her whole outlook. She said, when they tried to get her to say some words, she said, God is watching. 
God is watching. God is watching. That's all she said. And basically, she took it upon herself to campaign for the truth about my case to be made known. That's what led to what was called the Free Church Campaign, which she and you know other volunteers like you know Kwesi Prad, Tony Letha, and other people just took up on my on my on my behalf. And basically she made it a point to try to summarize in the simplest possible ways some of the issues in my case and to show why the judgment that had been delivered against me was not a just judgment. And she also made it a point to keep the public aware of all the processes that I was taking up, you know, in the court when I sought to have bail, um, which was refused by the same judge and all that. She made it a point to bring these matters to the knowledge of, of, of the public. And, and that, you know, that was, that was a, a tremendous effort on her part. You see, it relates to something I said earlier, that justice is also about the responsibility that we all have as people. And she felt it important that the truth about my case should be better known. Because sadly, for many people, the facts and circumstances which lead them into jail are little known about. And so they end up as forgotten prisoners who experience injustice and there is no recourse. I was blessed not only with good lawyers, but with a great wife who pressed this campaign uh, for all the months that I was in prison. And every month that I was in prison, she had a gathering, a, what she called a praise vigil, a gathering of family and friends, you know, in our church, as we done well church, just thanking God for my life. And basically, in praise, you see. So we started the overflow of praise. Even when you were even in when jail. I, I was in prison, and wow. and I I think that um, you know for me uh, everything turns on how dedicated my wife was to letting the truth of my case be known. I think she even had a documentary, yeah. which you've shown. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that you know, tells in brief terms the story of that case. So it, it's important for each of us when we're in such circumstances for the real facts to be known to the world so that justice which is being done in the name of the people is known by the people to be being done. Justice must not only be done, it must manifestly be seen to be done. That's another popular legal saying as well. But for it manifestly to be seen to be done, people have to know the facts. And that's what my wife ensured. That's in addition to just the personal things that she did. I mean, she did not want me to have to eat from the prisoner, especially if it's 60 pesos. <laughs> 60 pesos. So every single day she brought food from home. Every day. Every single day. I mean, you know, she went beyond the call of duty. And, um, and, and in fact, that was how come on the Sunday, November 16th, when I was so gravely ill, she was there that day. And since the prison directorate did not have any ambulance facilities nearby, it fell to her to have to arrange an ambulance that would then take me from Psalm Hospital, initially to 37 Hospital, and then eventually to the Cardiothoracic Center. So I, I, I can't, I overflow with praise to her as well. <laughs> I will worship you, lift you high above the earth. You are